Hello, everybody. We're going to get started. <laughs> so I'm Natasha Wiener. I'm the Historical Architect and Senior Design Reviewer for the SHPO office. And I'm here to introduce our speaker, um, who is the fabulous Miss Barbara Hubbard. <laughs> we all, I think we all know and love. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Barbara Howard is the Managing Partner and Director of Heritage Preservation for Stonebridge Learning, a continuing education resource for the heritage industry. She develops online courses, digital productions, and publications, and mobile applications, empowering people to recognize the significance of historic resources to preserve for the future generations, and to integrate them into everyday life through redevelopment and lifelong learning and community conversations, which is awesome. It's a long sentence. It is, but it is. That's what we're all about, isn't it? Um, so include, and, and uh, so she has worked for over 20 years in the heritage preservation industry in for-profit, non-profit, and governmental sectors, including leading the State Historic Preservation Offices in Iowa and Minnesota, and serving as a principal investigator for Architectural History Surveys. She serves, as the Minne she serves on the Minneapolis Heritage Preservation Commission, and is an associate member of the American Institute of Architects, and meets the Secretary's Interior Standards for Professional Qualification in architecture and architectural history. But please help me in welcoming Ms. Barbara Howard. And Natasha said I was supposed to give her a funny look, like I didn't appreciate the, uh... <laughs> Thanks, Natasha. Um, some of you might recall when I was the director of the Heritage Preservation Department, I've been out of Minnesota Historical Society for a little over a year now. Um, and so Stonebridge Learning um, is still just getting off the ground. It's still in that startup phase, but there are some courses online if you go check it out. Um, so I decided to come and speak to you about the rehab standards. And this uh, talk came out of the fact that every time I talk about the rehab standards, someone says, ew, that means I can't do anything to my building. <laughs> well, it doesn't. Um, so how many of you have used the rehab standards in this room? A few hands. How many of you are on preservation commissions? Okay. Uh, main streets? A few. How many of you own historic properties? All right. Do we have any architects in the room? Okay, I'll be careful not to speak ill of architects. <laughs> <laughs> um, any local history folks, museums, and historic societies? A few? Great. All right, how many of you think the rehab standards are all about what not to do on a historic building? Well, then we don't need to be here. <laughs> <laughs> how many people have no opinion? How many people aren't sure? <laughs> Apologies to Joe, I just walked out of the camera range for our uh, camera. Um, I do have a handout for you, but I'm going to wait to hand it out because otherwise you're going to be reading it before you need to. Um, <laughs> So the rehab standards are really just about the simple care and feeding of historic properties. And they truly can transform the way you think about your community's history, vitality, and long-term sustainability. So today I'm going to do a few things. I'm going to give you a little bit of a brief history background on the rehab standards, just so you know where they came from. Um, I'm going to give you the actual rehab standards, all ten of them. But I'm also going to tell you what the core of those standards are, the pure essence, so that you don't have to read the, the scary language. Um, and then I'm also going to explain how reasonable use can allow for numerous opportunities, um, preservation incentives, streamlined regulatory reviews, things like that. And then I have some examples of some specific communities that have used rehabilitation for transformation. So the brief history of the treatment standards. Um, the federal government has been doing preservation for over 100 years. Um, it was the 1966 National Historic Preservation Act that kind of set the stage for the National Park Service to become a leader in proper preservation practice. Um, and by the early 1970s, they were already starting to put out guidance. So they put out a grants and aid program manual that provided guidance for three basic treatments of historic buildings. Stabilization, restoration, and reconstruction. Just three. Then, 
At the end of the 1970s, so 1976 was a key year in bringing about the treatment standards. In March, uh, the Park Service decided to expand those three treatments to seven. They added acquisition, protection, preservation, and rehabilitation. Later in that year, those seven became eight. So you can tell it was very much a, a moving target for them. Um, they created the guidelines for rehabilitating old buildings. Um, kind of looks like this one back in, in the corner here. Um, and that actually was assisting the Department of Housing and Urban Development in their responsibilities under the National Historic Preservation Act. And then the big thing in 1976, the federal tax credit program came about. So in October, <coughs> Congress passed the legislation that would become the tax credit program. And by the next March, all of a sudden we have those eight guidelines for rehabilitating old buildings are now called standards for rehabilitation. And they were interim guidance for the um, tax credit program. It all went out for public input. We all know how public input goes on these sorts of things. Um, and those eight standards turned into 10. Um, and then by 1979, the first guidelines for rehabilitation were published. Um, I think this is kind of what it looked like at the end of the 70s. Um, and that was revised in 1983. So let's move forward through the 80s. 1992, the treatment standards were shaved down to four. And we're going to be looking at the four treatment standards just briefly. Um, and the most recent revision to the guidelines was just this year, 2017, um, the National Park Service released guidelines. The standards have been the same now since 1992, so those haven't really changed. Um, but the guidelines that go along with it have kind of morphed. And the National Park Service also has put out guidelines for um, the sustainability, um, guidelines on su sustainability for rehabilitating historic buildings, and they put out guidelines for the treatment of cultural landscapes. They continue to be improved, changed with new information um, and new technologies, which is a good thing. So this is where we stand today. Um, we have four treatment standards codified in 36 CFR 68. I'm going to try to stay away from all the crazy regulatory stuff, but um, that is where they are um, codified. The treatment standards as a whole apply to all property types. Um, they're only regulatory when they are applied to certain federal funding um, or state programs or local programs if they reference them. Um, the standards include uh, the standards, they include guidelines, which are kind of recommendations on what to do and what not to do. And then there's tons of other information online through the National Park Service that kind of augments all of that, including preservation briefs, interpreting the standards bulletins, and tons of stuff at the National Park Service website. So, this, presenta this presentation's focus is going to be on rehabilitation, but I think it's important for you to understand the other three standards that are also in use. Uh, because when they're applied to individual architectural projects, um, they actually become part of rehab projects. So preservation, I like to think of it as putting your building or your property under a bell jar. You're trying to stabilize it and keep it just as it is, how you found it. Um, Rehabilitation, that's supporting a continued or new use while retaining historic character. That's like recycling. You're trying to recycle the building, keep it into use. Um, restoration means you're preserving what's there and you're restoring historic fabric back to a specific point in time. Um, this is often used by local history organizations when they're trying to interpret a specific time period. And then reconstruction is you're building new based on documentation and you're replacing what has been lost. So all of these can be used in rehab projects. And there are standards and guidelines for all four. Um, and they can be found online in their new document. So let's focus on rehab. Here is one of its official definitions. Uh, I'm not going to read it for you, but you should um, notice how it's looking to the future. It's allowing for compatible alterations and additions to historic properties. The goal is to keep the properties in use. It's looking to the future. It also looks to the past. Um, it wants to preserve the portions and features that convey 
the historical, cultural, and architectural values of the property. It wants those things to remain intact. So modern alterations can be removed under the rehab standards. Uh, new alterations and additions are also possible. You want to have the building in use for the future. And that means usually there's some modifications. The primary goal is to ensure the property can remain in use while continuing to convey its historic significance. Because rehab allows for the most amount of modern intervention, it is the most widely used of those four treatment standards. So here they are. Um, I'm going to hand these out now. On the, the document that you're getting now, on one side you're going to see that little rehab uh, uh, house with the rehab or recycle thing around it. Those are the standards that are codified in 36 CFR 68. On the other side, there's one with a little dollar sign in it. There are two different sets of rehab standards. I'm going to concentrate on the ones that are general, as opposed to the ones that are for the tax credit program. The text of the rehab standards is pretty cumbersome, as you can see. So I'm going to go through each one, one by one, and I've kind of shortened them here, so you can kind of get to their core essence. Uh, rehab Standard 1 um, recognizes that current and future uses impact the property. Rehab Standards 2, 3, and 4 kind of all go together, and they're about understanding the property's history and significance. <coughs> rehab Standards 5, 6, and 7 are all about how to treat the property's historic fabric. Rehab Standard 8 um, asks you to consider the project's impact on archaeological sites. And the last two provide guidance on how to incorporate new design into rehabilitation projects. As I said, there are two sets. You can tell from the very brief background I gave you that these evolved over time. And the thing that drove it all was the tax credit program. The rehab standards for the tax credit program are codified in 36 CFR 67. And for all other National Park Service programs, they're in 36 CFR 68. So you have both of them there on your uh, handout. In the end, though, there's just a few general principles behind them. Um, you need to know the significance of your property and the condition of the historic fabric. It's really important to know your property before you start using the rehab standards. And then you have to have a plan before you get started. You need to do research that's necessary, um, and you need to start really thinking about what you're going to do with the property. And then, as always, do no harm. Um, the best course of action is always to do no harm. There are a few words that you're going to see over and over again in the rehab standards. So I'm going to go through them here just briefly so that you understand what the Park Service is trying to say in their long uh, standards. Spatial relationships, um, how properties and their materials are placed in relation to each other and to the surrounding environment. So here you have a picture of uh, the National Mall. It's very important to be thinking about not just how buildings relate to each other, but the spaces within the building. So where does your living room relate to the kitchen? Um, what's in the public portions of the building versus the private portions of the building? That's what spatial relationships are all about. Spaces are the volumes that make up a property and what surrounds it. Uh, the size, the shape, the volumes all help define, define the character of that space. Um, think about uh, Union Depot here in uh, in, up in St. Paul versus the space that you're going to see in a theater or the space you're going to see in a city council chambers. Features down here. This happens to be uh, James J. Hill House in St. Paul. Uh, structural and decorative components brought together to form a specific portion of the architecture. So think about the front facade, interior staircase, uh, a built-in cabinet within a, a property. It can also be super long corridors in the property. That's a feature. Um, or an open atrium. Construction techniques, how everything is coming together. Um, this is a structural detail of a chapel at McAllister College. Um, this includes the structural systems of the building, the assembly of the building envelope, 
which would be the roof and the walls and the windows and the doors, and how interior and exterior architectural details are assembled. Materials, I think you all know what materials are. It's the nuts and bolts of the building. Um, finishes, how those materials are finished. So in this picture, you can see there's brick on the on your left side. It's a, a rough red brick. And on the left on the on your right side is a glazed white brick. So think about the finishes and how those um, textures, decorations, um, glossiness, rigidity, things like that, how that factors in. And craftsmanship. Um, I don't know if any of you were here for Dennis Gardner's uh, presentation on the Capitol. Craftsmanship is what those stonemasons were doing to, to make the marble sing. Um, this actually happens to be in the Capitol too, but it's wood. So throughout the rest of this presentation, you're going to see these images, and you'll see how they tie into the rehab standards. And as always, the National Park Service wants to give you as much guidance as they can. So there's a preservation brief. So trying to figure out what an architectural character of a building is, there's an entire brief written on that, um, and it's available online. Are you guys ready to dig in? I can tell you're all excited already. So I said rehab standard one is all about how use affects a property. Notice that this rehab standard allows for any type of use as long as it requires minimal changes to materials, features, spaces, spatial relationships. Why do you think this is? Form follows function. I was hoping the architects would come in on that one. Um, design and use are intrinsically linked. Um, every building is created for a specific purpose, whether it's architect design or if it's just a shed that you're getting from the, the local hardware store. Um, if it's constructed by a skilled craftsperson or um, by a, a local contractor, um, they are intrinsically linked. Historic uses do not always result in minimal change. Think about how spaces for media organizations have changed over the years. hundred years ago, you needed to have spaces for all your reporters, your printing presses, everything to create a newspaper. What do you need today? Laptop. Well, an iPad, right? <laughs> a tablet, and you can be anywhere in the world. You don't have to have a big space. So historic uses don't always result in minimal change. Um, so maintaining a historic use should carefully consider whether changes to the property will be minimal. This is especially true for industrial buildings because technology and industry requirements change over time. The um, Orpheum Theater in Minneapolis, we'll, we'll come back in later. Um, it, they decided to retain the original use when they did the rehab. It's a very specific design to that building. This is not the Orpheum's floor plan. But consider if this was reused for apartments, offices, or retail spaces. Think of how much that would change. So you have a historic theater, you come in on the right hand side, you have a huge ornate lobby full of painting and beautiful uh, architectural features. And then you go through the, the first set of lobby doors and you start to have everything quiet down. And then you go into the auditorium and then you're back in this soaring space um, with this, the floor sloping down. It's very specific. Now imagine it with commercial in it. It doesn't really look like a theater anymore, does it? This is what the essence of rehab standard number one is. Regardless of what use you're putting into it, there needs to be minimal change. Number two. Uh, two, three, and four, like I said, are all about knowing the history and significance of your property. You need to know your property before you get started working with the rehab standards. Um, both of these images show multi-story buildings in an urban setting, but they're very distinctive. What aspects of the historic character tell you how these buildings were used? What are the buildings on the top? Houses. 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 Yeah. How did you know that? Porches, rooms. Yeah. Hip the roof, the gable front roofs. Air conditioner. <laughs> air conditioner. I bet there's some air conditioning and case things down there too. What 
What are these down here? Storefronts. What made you say they're commercial? What what makes them commercial? Looks like Main Street. Main Street. Close to the sidewalk. Close to the sidewalk. They have seemingly flat roofs, although we all know that they have a little bit of slip on those. This is what rehab standards is trying, number two is trying to get you to look at. You're trying to look at that big picture of what the historic character of the building is. There are materials and features and spaces and spatial relationships that have to be considered when you're applying this rehab standard. So this is a, a rehab project in Minneapolis. This is the Pillsbury A mill. These are before the rehab is done. I don't have final pictures on this one, but it's an industrial building. We're talking about a huge industrial complex, and they're converting it into housing. So we already know that use is flexible, but you need to make sure that it still looks like an industrial building. And so they've kept some of the um, the exposed walls on the inside um, in the upper right hand corner. And I know that this isn't finished, Natasha, you probably know. They probably put plaster of some sort on that, but they kept these huge openings with a light bulb to try to show that industrial character. That's right outside of some apartments. So rehab standard number two, preserve historic character. You're looking at the big picture, not the details. Number three. Number three and, and four kind of go together because they really, really go to the history and the significance of the property. Rehab standard one, number three wants you to recognize the property as a physical record of its time and not to create a false history through the work you do. I cheated, I put a false history up here. <laughs> this happens to be Pioneer Town, California, which was uh, built by Gene Autry in 1946. It is a historic fake. <laughs> I would hate to have to apply the rehab standards to a historic fake, but that's what that is. So, so what is false history? Um, how can you create a false history? Um, the first two of these are actually in rehab standard number three. Um, conjectural features. These are features that appear to date from the same period of construction as the historic building. But they were never included in the original design, and they were never incorporated into the development of the property. They're often proposed simply because they look nice, or because the neighbor has it next door, and it might be okay. That's a conjectural feature. Features from other historic properties, you've seen them. There are salvage shops all over. Um, they may actually date from the same period as your historic property, but they were taken from another building. Um, obviously, never take a historic feature out of another property, if at all possible. <laughs> but we know that there's tons of salvage shops. So using non-distinctive salvage materials often is OK. You can find things like wood flooring that might be appropriate, or or very simple window sash that might be okay to bring into a project. Um, but if you're looking at distinctive architectural features, columns, fireplace mantles, ornamentation, make sure you have the documentation that shows it actually was something similar in your property. Um, otherwise, it won't meet the standards. And I always throw in unbuilt features. It's not mentioned in the rehab standards. I think it is mentioned in the guidelines, um, but it's not called out in the actual standard. Um, architects will know rarely are the final construction plans that you design actually built. We all know that there are tons of change orders. Um, most buildings are not built the way they were originally intended to be built. Um, there's uh, a lot of questions should you be trying to put it back to what the original intent was. We actually look at what the actual building was. So what was built? Things were taken out of designs for one reason or another. Sometimes it's just cost. Um, sometimes it's because the architect decided that it didn't need to be there, or the client decided it didn't need to be there. You shouldn't put in unbuilt features um, on a rehabilitation project. If you do, it won't meet rehab standard number three. 
Number four, we're still on that uh, trying to understand the history of the property. You need to know your property. Uh, preserve significant changes. Um, this is also often called acquired significance. When you hear that, now you know where it came from. Changes to a property that have acquired significance in their own right should be preserved. Um, this time the rehab standards aren't looking at what you're doing to the property as much as they want you to understand that some of those changes are important. So no property stays the same. It always develops and evolves over time. Which of those changes are significant for you to preserve as part of your rehab project? I'm showing you here the Pringle Hardware Building in Hastings. How many of you were at the conference last year? But if you, you might have seen this in Hastings. It's in their historic district. I looked at it not knowing the history of the building, and I saw the dates at the top, 1863 and 1901. In 1863, this was built with a barrel roof, barrel vault. And in 1901, it was modified to this configuration. Obviously, there's been a few other modifications since then. Um, but the building, including the significant modification, the removal of the barrel roof, is listed on the National Register as a contributing property in this historic district. If this were being rehabbed under the tax credits, and I strongly encourage it happening, <laughs> it's actually a great little building. Um, it just needs some love. Um, but you would have to keep the, the 1901 incarnation that took away the barrel roof. That's significant. You don't necessarily go back to the 1863 barrel roof. I've included a couple examples of, of this standard because it's one that a lot of questions come up. I know on preservation commissions um, and in tax credit projects. This is a church in Clinton, Iowa. Um, it was originally built in 1864. Um, and in 1906, the interior of the church was drastically modified. They flipped it. So over here you can see what was originally the front of the church. And you can imagine the stairs that would have gone up and the entry would have been here. Um, that's the entry now. It's on the butt end of that church. That was done in 1906. Um, in the 1940s, they did another major alteration, this time on the interior. And it's kind of hard to see in the, the lower right there um, what looks like stone is just plaster. But that was a major remodel on the inside to make it look like stone, kind of like pearl stone, like you'd see on the outside of buildings in the 40s. I'm sure you, you guys see that a lot in your communities. Um, this was done on the inside. Both of these acquired significance in their own right, and when it was listed on the National Register, it was listed in this condition. It would be important to preserve all of that. Here's another drastic example. Again, needing a little bit of love, but probably not as much as you might think by looking at it. This is the Union National Bank building in Ames, Iowa. It was built in 1890 with a brick facade. I bet you could just picture it there on the corner. Um, probably pretty ornate. Well, in 1916, they modernized it with stucco. And they put on this uh, Corinthian column door surround in 1916. It's one of the first stucco buildings in Ames, Iowa. Yep, it needs to be preserved. It was listed like this. It's within the period of significance. And I'm trying try not to look at my fellow commissioner, but imagine if it came before us at, uh, oh, no. yeah, it'd be tough. But they have acquired significance in their own right, and that's what rehab standard number four is all about. So we have standard number five. This is going to go along with number six and seven, and it's all about the details. We've been talking about kind of those big picture items, character, the history, the significance. Now we're going to get down to the details, the actual fabric. Um, as you can see, even a removal of one single character defining feature can change the look of a building dramatically. I love this little community. This is down in Iowa, too. It's down in Corning. You know that there's something wrong with that building, right? Just by looking at it. It's missing 
a window, possibly the the uh, cornice. Imagine what it would look like. I played with Photoshop. <laughs> That tells you how important that historic fabric can be. One little tiny change can just drastically change the, the building. So rehab standard number five, you want to preserve historic fabric. Um, here's an example. I'm going to try to get you guys talking again. I know it's late in the afternoon. If this is what you were faced with, which, which of this historic fabric do you think needs to be preserved if this was following the rehab standards? The floors, is the height of the buildings, yes. yeah, the number of stories, yeah. The wall things between each window. Yeah. And on the other side? What about the storefronts? Do you see anything in the storefronts that needs to be preserved? What's the story? Rhythm. Rhythm? Rhythm pattern. The cave that's decoration on the, the front. It was from terracotta, I'm guessing. Tiger horse. Yeah, tiger horse. No, <laughs> I'm not sure what that originally was. It looks like some sort of lodge building to me. But I'm not. The windows. As well. so the windows. Really Notice the the difference between the windows on the far right building compared to the, the more modern ones over here. So you're starting to get it. You're looking at the historic fabric. You're looking at materials. Materials, features, finishes, construction techniques, and craftsmanship. What about these? No, everyone's laughing. You know, it's probably more modern, right? Yeah. Okay. So continuing in that vein of historic fabric, this is all about the historic fabric. Um, number six, we have no, standard number six, repair before replacement in kind. I know you've all heard it before. Um, again, you have to know your property. This time you need to know the condition of your property. It's not necessarily about the history and the significance as much as it is about the condition of the fabric. And again, the general principle of do no harm. Um, we all know architectural materials age. Everything degrades over time. I'm dying my hair. It's degrading over time. Everything degrades over time. It would be ridiculous to think that that can be stopped or reversed. Um, but most historic fabric can be re preserved and repaired, even when it might be looking like it's falling apart. Um, broken beams, cracked plaster, things like that can be repaired without entirely replacing the historic feature. Um, Here's a good example, the E.E. Warren uh, Opera House. Take a look at the windows on that turret. It's kind of hard to see with the lighting in this room. Um, this was taken off of it. They're rounded. They're not flat windows. So with something like that, you really have to think about how you're going to repair it before replacing it. You can't go down to a lumber yard and just buy a new window. Um, how do you make that decision? The National Park Service asks you to look at these things. You want to look at the severity of the deterioration. You want to look at what your various repair options are. The importance of the feature in conveying that historic character. And of course, cost always comes into play. We always like to downplay that a little bit, but um, cost is always a factor. Um, so that's what you're looking at when you're trying to decide whether or not to replace in kind. Um, and then in-kind replacement can include historic materials. Again, that's, that's salvage, either from non-significant places in your own building or if, you, if it's very nondescript things like flooring or simple window sashes, you could um, use that out of salvage. Yards, just keep rehab standard number three in mind. New materials, we often see this. Wood is replaced with wood. Um, stone is replaced with stone. Um, it's just new material in where the old material was. Brick is a tough one because the size of bricks have changed over time. And the finish of bricks have changed quite a bit over time. So that's a little harder to replace new. Um, but it's possible. And everyone's favorite, substitute materials. I could do an entire presentation on substitute materials. Uh, already, already bored, yeah. Um, 
cast stone uh, vinyl siding, fiber cement boards, uh, just to put down hardy because they do some good stuff too. Um, keep in mind that substitute materials should only be used on a limited basis to replace severely deteriorated historic materials. And I read that directly out of the National Park Service guidelines because I feel like we have to say it all the time. Um, severely deteriorated, limited basis. Um, and the key on that is you want to make sure that the material still looks the same. So um, if you're replacing some cedar siding with, with hardy board, fresh on my mind for some reason, um, you want to make sure that it has the same profile if possible um, and uh, is, has the same exposure. You're not putting up a full hardy board, you're putting up a, a three inch exposure or something like that. So that's rehab standard number six, repair before replacement in kind. It's a tough one. Everyone thinks it's easier just to buy new and put it in. Um, but the whole goal is to try to repair the, to keep the historic fabric there. So really look at whether or not something can be repaired before you think about replacing it. Continuing down on preserving historic fabric, we have rehab number seven, always be gentle. This one seems like a simple one, doesn't it? You think it'd be the easiest one for people to remember? Yeah, it's not. <laughs> but do these um, three steps and you're gonna be headed in the right direction. Do your research first. There's tons of information out there about how to treat historic fabric. And this rehab standard is usually called into play for cleaning. That's probably the most common time it's brought in to discussions. Um, so do your re research first. There's tons of information out there about how to treat brick, how to treat wood, how to treat artwork, all of that. Um, test the treatment in an inconspicuous area. And then if you don't know, ask an expert. Always have a plan. That's how you have a plan. Do your research, test, and ask an expert if you're out of any other uh, ideas. You'll note that um, the rehab standards for tax credits on this one, that's the, again, that's the side that has a little dollar sign in the, the house, actually calls out sandblasting as being inappropriate in the rehab standard. You'll see that this one doesn't, um, just talks about chemical and physical treatments. And I don't know that that sandblasting thing has been in there for a long time, and I think it's because it was originally, people thought sandblasting was okay. But then we learned that it really, really does harm the brick. You can see here, this brick wall, which is the right-hand side of that building, has been sandblasted. It's now a perfect place for graffiti. Um, when you take off that outer crust of the, the brick, it really causes damage to the building. It allows water in. Um, depending on whether it's been repointed or not, you could actually start cracking brick when the water gets in. Freeze thaw here in Minnesota, you all know how it is. Here's another example of cleaning. I'm gonna say right now, if you ever look at anything that says blast in it, it's probably not the right thing to do to a building. <laughs> Here you can see, and this is a non-historic test area of a historic property, where they tested walnut blasting and glass blasting. I heard um, people trying to use styrofoam popcorn kernels. Um, I don't know what the latest things are for blasting anymore. But this is showing you how they just, they were looking at testing it. So look at how the walnut blasting, I think walnuts, you know, the shells are, are not that hard. It's the nut that's hard. Look at how much that wood has raised grains just from that little tiny bit of cleaning. And you can see down in the lower right hand corner, I don't know if you can see the name Steve on the board. So they've taken glass and they've tried to blast it to get the paint off. And look at how much farther they'd have to go to get the rest of that paint off. The good news is, this testing showed them that blasting was bad. And they came back and did it the right way. So um, another thing to think about with cleaning, um, chemical cleaning. Uh, again, if you uh, were at the, the presentation of the Capitol, that was just before this, and they were talking about the art conservation. Whenever you're using chemicals on a historic property, historic artwork, you have to be really careful about how those chemicals are being used, because it might actually do something bad. With the artwork, you could kill off the paint. 
with buildings, you can actually have bad reactions with various types of stones, with various types of metal. Um, you can create uh, complicated scientific chemical reactions between surfaces that you wouldn't expect. So always be careful. You can etch surfaces um, on sandstones, things like that. Again, the National Park Service has tons of information online about how to clean historic properties. Uh, and that's what Rehab Standard Number 7 is all about. Be gentle in all you do. You would be amazed what just like, a very light water soak can do to clean some stones. How many of you uh, thought you'd see archaeology on something about rehab standards? Anybody? You all know what archaeology is, I'm presuming. Um, studying human history through scientific analysis of landscapes, sites, features, artifacts. Um, here's a picture of uh, excavated building foundations in Harper's Ferry. Um, this is actually in a National Park Service site, and they're interpreting how the archaeology of that building has shown the evolution of the building over time. Um, so you want to protect ar archaeological resources regardless of the, your project. Um, a few things you need to consider. Use an archaeologist to determine whether there are archaeological concerns. I'm an architectural historian. Natasha's an architect. <laughs> we don't necessarily know about archaeology. Uh, you need to bring in the professionals to tell you whether or not there are archaeological features to be concerned about. And you have to think about not just the project area, but staging areas, wherever you're storing all your materials for your rehab project, and access. How are you getting to your, your building or your property to do the rehab? Um, if you can't protect archaeological resources, it talks about mitigation. Mitigation is basically making up for an impact to a historic structure. Mitigation doesn't usually come into play in tax credit projects, but it will come into play in other areas where the rehab standards are, are being used. And mitigation can include documenting the resource and preserving the place, just protecting it, covering it. Um, it could include actual data recovery, which means pulling everything out of the ground and writing up reports on it. Um, and it can also include public outreach. Um, so presentations like this on archaeology um, or about the, the resource and its significance. Um, what are you looking for? There's a lot of stuff that could be near a building. You have construction trench. You know how much information is in that construction trench? All of the contractors that just threw their trash as they were building the building. That's all archaeological evidence. Um, foundations, like you saw in the Harvest Ferry building. Um, Trash middens, again, um, nearby privy pits, you know what privies are? Yeah, the outhouse, that can be near a building. Um, they're out there now, but the pits are still there. Oops, sorry. Um, associated landscapes, if you had a, a building that was in a design landscape, that maybe the, the landscape is no longer there, there's still evidence of that landscape on the ground. And then unassociated landscapes, um, we know that most of the land here was um, inhabited by Native Americans long before your Americans got here. That has nothing to do with the building that you're currently looking at. But the evidence is still there, and it's important to protect that. Southern Never Right. Um, that's the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard. It's a huge tax credit project out in Philadelphia. Um, and they decided to keep the railroad lines. Obviously, the lines aren't in use anymore, but they integrated that into the paving pattern of their projects out there. Um, and down below, if you were in Hastings last year, you saw the presentation of the archaeology in Hastings. This came out of a Section 106 project, which is the lecture that's going on across the way. Um, but that's an example of mitigation. Um, Michelle Terrell came out and talked to you about what she found, and they did a little display in town about what was found related to a, a, a project there. I think that was a road project or a bridge project. So yes, archaeology, even if you're sitting on a preservation commission that only ever looks at buildings, you need to be thinking about archaeology. The last two standards, and then we'll get into some more, more fun stuff, um, Rehab Standards 9 and 10 are all about new construction. 
Um, they are the most complicated for people to understand. Um, they're ones that it really helps to have architects involved, um, especially architects that have experience doing work on historic properties. And it's about additions, major alterations, and any new construction. So under rehab standard number nine, it's super long. But basically what you need to do is preserve historic fabric. That shouldn't be a surprise. We've been talking about it for eight other standards by now, right? And then you, your new construction needs to be differentiated and compatible. Easy, right? How do you make it different and yet make it the same? Well, keep in mind it's not the same. It's compatible. You want it to go with the historic property, not necessarily mimic it. So differentiated, the new design should not simply mimic the character defining features of the property. Um, much like historic properties need to be recognized for their history and significance, you need to recognize the new design for its history and significance. It's new. It's okay to look new. Um, and it should be recognizable as such. And by differentiating the new construction from the old, the layers of history become visible, which is really part of becoming a vibrant project. Um, compatibility, it's all about ensuring the historic character of the property is retained and conveys the historic significance. Um, the new design should complement the historic design through its use of materials and features, size, scale, proportion, <coughs> massing. The new design should not become the focal point. And that's a key part of the compatibility. You want it to, to work with the, the historic property, but it can't be overshadowing the historic property. The goal of this rehab standard is to preserve the historic character of the property and ensure the new construction does not detract from it or create a false history or become a main focus. So I told you this is um, the Orpheum would come back. The Orpheum Theater here had a, a new addition to their stage house back in the 90s. And um, I don't know if this went through a review at the preservation office. I was not there at the time. Um, but you can see the addition very clearly. It's still brick, slightly different color brick. Um, but you can also see the, the decorative lines still coming across. And then a few of the things that I really like about this addition are the, the decoration within the brickwork. Um, let me point it out. And then notice the arched one over there. Here you have that same box and the arch. So it's bringing over some of the details from the historic building, completely simplifying it. It's obviously not historic. It's new, but it still complements. And there's also a, a slight reveal between the addition and the historic building. So some of the ways that you can have differentiated yet compatible is to start looking at facade placement, how things are um, in relation to each other. So this is a, a building out east. It has a small elevator addition off to the back. You can see that they took it away from the street. So it's pushed back from the street. Um, and yet it still has some of the same lines as the historic one. The brickwork on the addition kind of matches the stonework on the, the original. Um, another way to look at it is about the cornice. You have a very ornate cornice on the historic, not so ornate on the addition. So you're looking at the facade placement here, you're looking at material choice and design details. The brick is, it's a similar color brick, it's slightly off, but the, the mortar is really pronounced on the addition, whereas you can't see it at all, basically, on the original. Reversibility, we have standard number 10. Anything new should be reversible. That's probably reversible, don't you think? Yeah, please don't. <laughs> it doesn't meet standard number nine. We don't have compatibility there. Um, it's differentiated. So that's not what we're talking about reversible. Yes, that entire metal construct can probably come off the facade just fine. Um, but that's not what they're getting at. 
what they're trying to get at with rehab standard number 10 is that you um, do as little intervention on the historic property as possible. So if in some day the addition has to come off, the historic property is still intact. That's what reversibility is all about. So place your additions on non-primary facades. You saw that elevator addition on the bank. Here there's an elevator addition around the corner on this public building. Um, it's on a non-primary facade. If something is messed up, if historic material has to come out, it's not a primary area. Place new functions that are not, um, place new functions on properties and structures that aren't even connected to the structure. So if you have a large property and you need new functions, it may not be appropriate to put it in your whole building. You can build something else. Um, use non-significant interior spaces or spaces that have already been altered. So what you're looking at here is a, a city hall type building. Um, and these three doors are at the front of that room in the upper right hand corner. So this space and this historic property had been completely gutted. There was nothing left. And it was perfect to have a space for presentations like this. So they chose that space to put in all of their new materials and lighting and electronics and things like that because it had already been gutted. Um, you can use uh, windows and doors to create uh, connections between spaces. I tried to get a picture in here. Um, that elevator space actually goes in through some, some existing historic doors that were just repurposed as the way to get in through the elevator space. Um, I didn't have the right lens on my camera for that, but um, if you do need to remove historic material, make sure it's documented and saved if you can, so it can go back into a property if necessary. Um, with rehab standards 9 and 10, if you're looking at additions, always keep rehab standard number 8, archaeology in mind, um, because you could impact the archaeological site. Um, one thing I noticed with this uh, rehab was when they converted this space into a public space like this, they needed to have more egress, uh, ways out of the building in case of the fire. So they decided to incorporate a little pedestrian door, which when I first saw the building, I never even recognized. But it was incorporated in, and it's, it's straight in front of me in that picture there. See, they're not so scary. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of text in that rehab standard list, but really, if you get it down to its core essence, they're, they're really pretty simple. Um, know your building, have a plan, do no harm. So how can that transform the way you think about your community's history, vitality, and sustainability? Well, first, stop thinking about, thinking about the rehab standards as what not to do. Um, instead of looking at what you can do. We have standard number one. You can have old uses, you can have current uses, and you can have new uses. You can do anything you want, as long as it has minimal change. We have standard number two, historic character. That one, what are you doing? You're preserving your historic character of your building, of your properties, of your neighborhood, of your communities. Numbers three and four, the false history, you are starting to recognize the history of that property without overshadowing, overshadowing it with your own project. Five, six, and seven, that's the details. You're preserving all of those unique details that make that property unique and bring vitality to your community. Even number eight, which no one ever thinks about, you're recognizing that archaeological resources might actually exist. Um, there might be fewer in downtown or crowded settings. They've probably been destroyed, but in other areas that um, they, they actually could be there and they could be protected. And number nine and 10, what can you do? You can use whatever new design you want. Differentiated, compatible, reversible. But you can make it a, a, a new design. You can bring in architects and, and use new design to bring your building to what you want it to be. Remember that the standards are all about proper care and feeding of historic properties. Um, they aren't meant to stop you in your tracks um, in fact, I think it, they're actually meant to make you think more about your building and how it can be reused um, in a, a new, exciting way. And they can help you transform your community. <laughs>
This is one of my favorite quotes. Um, William Morris was actually talking about the demolition of historic properties. He's one of the godfathers of the, the international preservation movement. I don't know how else to say it. Um, but what I like about this is that he isn't just talking about demolition. He's talking about playing buildings false. This isn't necessarily the false history. But our day-to-day -day management of historic properties can play buildings false. But buildings may be inanimate. They are actually living and breathing buildings when they have people going through them. Um, they're built of brick stone and other things that need care and feeding. Um, that historic fabric has to survive, not just for us and to protect the past, but for the future. Um, stewardship is a, a, a big responsibility when you're looking at historic properties, but it brings lots and lots of opportunities. Um, a recent Main Street America report, I don't have the date on here, um, in main streets across the country, over 8,000 buildings were rehabbed, and that brought 6,000 new businesses, 28,000 jobs, and $4 billion in reinvestment, coast to coast. Not all of those projects probably follow the rehab standards, but quite a few of them did. If you were at the preservation conference last year, you might have seen Thompson May's keynote. He's from the National Trust. He did a huge blog series on the National Trust about the benefits of historic preservation, and he called out um, continuity, memory, individual identity, civic identity, beauty, history, architecture, learning, <coughs> sacredness, creativity, ancestry, sustainability, community, economics. All of those can be boiled down to these three things. These are the benefits that you get from embracing the rehab standards in your communities. Cultural benefits. We become better connected to not just ourselves, but to other people through the places that we preserve. And a mutual understanding of, of where we live, work, and play. Um, historic properties help bring that sense of identity to all of us. Environmental, we all know the Greens building is the one that's already built. Um, but think about preserving existing buildings as being more energy efficient than demolition and building new. Um, and it also contributes to the preservation of the natural environment. Um, benefits in water and air quality, biodiversity, uh, preservation of non-renewable resources, forests, ecosystems. Economic benefits, it costs money to tear down buildings and build them. Often you'll see what the cost of the new building is, they don't always tell you what the cost of the demolition is. That needs to be factored in. Um, but there's also direct and indirect economic impact. Um, preservation incentives, uh, wages and induced effects. Uh, Natasha has, has dutifully <coughs> sent out her annual report of the economic impact of the tax credit program. It's awesome. We know that it has an economic impact. Um, and that economic impact ripples through all of the properties around the projects. Uh, heritage tourism is another benefit. By being a faithful steward, which has responsibilities, you got to maintain your building, try to fill it with active use, share the building and its history. You now know your property if you're following the rehab standards. You need to know that history. And you can share that building and its history. It's all a big responsibility. But look at all the opportunities that come from all of that. You can prevent vandalism by keeping the buildings occupied. You can provide recreation. I think we all got a little walking tour for Albert Lee. It's recreation within your community. You can incentivize building ownership by fixing up buildings and hopefully bring in new people in town. You create connections between people in your community. Um, you can increase visitation in your community. Again, the heritage tourism aspect. And all of that ends up in growing your community as a whole. So whether they're, the benefits are financial, aesthetic, recreational, or another type of opportunity, they form the foundation of those three benefits. And of course, the biggest benefit that always everyone looks for, financial incentives. There are financial incentives for preservation. Um, property tax abatements, exemptions. Um, I don't know how many communities in Minnesota have abatements for 
um, historic preservation. There used to be the old house law um, that was in Minnesota, and I know that talked about doing that for commercial properties as well, where your property taxes wouldn't increase necessarily after a rehab. Um, you'd have a period of time where you could um, wait for that <laughs> increase to come. Income tax credits, the 20% federal income tax credit is huge, huge. It's been, when did Minnesota's come into play? 2010. So most states now, not all of them, but quite a few states have state tax credits that actually match that. So we're looking at like 40% of your rehab costs coming back to you as a tax credit on your income taxes. Um, there are public and private grants, obviously. Legacy is out there for certain entities, but there are private grants and foundations that look at actually helping to revitalize communities. Preservation is a huge part of that. Streamlined reviews. Um, people always forget about this, but I, I mention this because um, when you're following the rehab standards, it is much easier to go through a local design review. If you're on a preservation commission, you know that that design review is going to be based on the rehab standards. All the design guidelines that we use on our commissions on a day-to-day -day basis are based on the rehab standards. So if you're a property owner and you're doing rehab and you follow the rehab standards, in all likelihood, that'll help you get through the design review. And of course, there's Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. Again, that was the session across the way. But if you're following the rehab standards, it's much easier to get to that no adverse effect determination that becomes so important on federal projects. Um, these two buildings, uh, down in Mason City, if anyone's going on the Mason City tour tomorrow, you'll probably see these. Um, these receive federal tax credits, and then they also had a grant from the federal government for the rehab. And the reviews could be combined and streamlined. It's in a historic district that's locally reviewed. It's in a Main Street district. All of those reviews could be streamlined into one single review to make it a lot easier to get your cash for the grant and get your tax credits at the end of the project. So I just have four examples here of communities that have embraced preservation. And some of these embraced preservation before there was such a thing as rehab standards. Um, Charleston, I haven't heard how Charleston did in um, all the rain Irma this weekend. Um, Charleston, in 1920, created the Society for the Preservation of Old Dwellings. It's now the Preservation Society of Charleston. It is one of the first um, organized efforts to preserve uh, properties near this uh, commercial area, but it was about the neighborhoods surrounding it. Um, within 11 years of that organization forming, they created a zoning ordinance that prohibited use, specific uses, and required architectural reviews. It's the very first local design review in the U.S. that was created by zoning. And since then, the cultural and environmental and economic benefits have been outstanding. It's now a huge heritage tourism destination. You could go down, hop in the little cart, and be pulled around by mules and horses through the, the historic areas. Hannibal, Missouri. Has anyone been down there? A few of you? Hannibal, Missouri is this little tiny town. They just hosted their statewide preservation conference this year. Little tiny town. And it all started with that. Those, those houses. Um, Mark Twain. Um, that's the Mark Twain Boyhood Home and Museums. Of course, it's all um, Samuel Clemens. But um, they have a huge artist community now. Um, and they also are the home of the uh, Belvedere Historic Preservation School. Is that what it's called? You guys know the name Bob Yap? He used to be on PBS. He spoke at one of these conferences. He yeah, he spoke yeah. at one of these conferences not so long ago. He has his own preservation school in Hannibal. They're bringing in all kinds of artists for the community. He brings in all kinds of students for the workshops that he presents. Little tiny community, just because they've embraced their, their history and uh, doing things the right way by their historic buildings. One of my favorite, um, I showed you the picture of Pioneer Town. That's about 40 minutes away from Palm Springs, California. Um, as you may know, it was a mid-century modern tourist mecca 
Um, uh, they, they've recently begun to embrace their history. I've been going there since the 90s. I had a brother who was stationed out there. My parents ended up buying a house for the winter out there. And so I've been in Palm Springs for a long time. And for a long time, they really didn't care about their history. They knew Frank Sinatra. They knew Bob Hope. They knew Elvis had his honeymoon there. So they had all of these big, big ideas. But then they started to realize, holy cow, we have this amazing architecture. And they said that's a gas station over there that's now a visitor center. They have these amazing motels and mid-century um, tourism attractions. And little by little, they're starting to look at the commercial area. And that uh, building is the business office for Clark and Frey, um, the architects who designed much of the rest of Palm Springs. So they've, they've embraced it. They have mid-century modern symposiums every year where hundreds of people come to town just to look at the mid-century modern architecture. To my knowledge, they don't have local design review. I don't know how they're doing tax credits. I don't know how they're doing on that. I know they have a few national register properties, but they've still embraced the history, and they're embraced in trying to do everything the right way. Tulsa. Anyone go to the preservation conference from the National Trust out in Tulsa? 2008, maybe? I had no idea what I was getting into when I went to Tulsa. Tulsa's a 20th century community, so they really boomed in the early 20th century because of oil and all of the, the industry out there. But they've been going strong since, and so they have resources, mostly 20th century um, resources. This is a tax credit project that was just finished when I was out there in 2008. That's their convention center. Um, it's a behemoth, but it's being used, and I think they're trying to figure out ways to how to use it better. And that cute little bank, I want to go back and see, it has been rehabbed into a restaurant. Um, again, I don't know if it did tax credits. The photos online look like it, they did everything the right way. Um, but it's an amazing little bank, and it's called The Vault now. It's a restaurant. Just by embracing their history, knowing it's 20th century, and then trying to do things the right way. They're starting to revitalize. They have some amazing little Main Street communities. Um, they have one there that's been there since well, about four years. Um, this is in an area not right down the home, but it's one of their little commercial nodes. They've had 25 new businesses in the last four years. $12 million in investments in that little Main Street, and 200 jobs just by embracing preservation and rehabilitation. So remember, rehab standards are not about what not to do to a historic property. Use them to transform the way you're thinking about your community's history, vitality, and long-term sustainability. And remember these three general principles. Know your property, have a plan, do no harm, and most importantly, don't forget to celebrate your success because that's where you start to get that induced benefit of preservation to all the buildings surrounding your building and around all of the communities that are surrounding your community. That's where you can find me. Um, uh, this presentation is going to be in an upcoming issue of uh, the National Alliance of Preservation Commission's uh, Alliance Review, which Mike mentioned this morning in the opener. Um, and um, I'm also going to be presenting on something completely different at the Society for Architectural Historians conference that'll be here next April. There should be a slip on that in your um, folders. And don't forget the, the Preservation Commission conference next year in Des Moines. <coughs> that'll be pretty exciting. Do you guys have any questions for me? You're all asleep. It's rehab standards. <laughs> but you can, you can do it. Strikes me the trick is getting communities to think of themselves as historic. I mean, I think the energy it is, is that's where the energy has to go. And you can do it. You don't need a lot of money to do that, but you do need a lot of energy. And that's right. And that's where you need to celebrate your success. So um, one of the things that we all have a tough time doing, I did both preservation offices I worked at, the commission that I'm sitting on, 
Um, we, we don't celebrate all the success that we have. And that's how you start to get your communities to recognize its historic nature and the importance that, that uh, rehabilitation can have for the community. Yeah. It's that, that public outreach bit that's always missing. We have these conferences. Often, as I asked you at the beginning, many of you have been to other conferences. You're sitting on commissions. You're sitting on main streets. Um, you've been to these things, but it's how you get to the, the other ones in your community. Yeah. The, just the thing that made me crazy. There are many things that make me crazy. But the Star Tribune building, the old Star Tribune building in Minneapolis, was demolished to make way for the stadium. And it was, I don't think Barbara was on the commission then, but the question was, was the Star Tribune historic or not? And the answer was clearly, yes, it was. But we didn't think for a single moment that that was going to stop a billion dollar development. It wasn't going to happen. But what was funny, if you're masochistic, I guess, reading the comments in the Star Tribune was, those heritage preservation people, they hate the Vikings. <laughs> no. <laughs> that was, it was just so frustrating that people thought that's what the issue was. And that's one of the things we struggled with is, how do you get people to understand what it's really about? You know, this is not about paying for billion dollars. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. Do you have these adopt the standards? Was there design guidelines that you design? Some do. Um, I think when you start as a preservation commission, you're probably starting out with the, the standards. But one of the great things about um, being on a preservation commission and working within a certified local government program is you begin to understand the important importance of design guidelines. So design guidelines are to help guide changes in development within certain areas of your community. So if you have a downtown commercial district, you can develop a specific set of design guidelines for that district that bring in the standards, but also recognize what's on the ground. Um, so the rehab standards are meant to be extremely, I don't want to say vague, but they're supposed to be very flexible so that they can be applied to any situation. The design guidelines actually helps you get down to that know your historic property. You know the types of buildings, you know what kind of issues you have in those buildings, and you can provide guidance on them that way. Um, and then if you do have design guidelines, then the Preservation Commission can use those along with the standards, but you, you primarily follow the design guidelines. Other questions, comments? All right, thank you all for coming.